Hey, it's Joyce Conroy. You are on the block party with Ernie Sheffalo, award-winning creative director and designer. And Ernie, we were talking in the past about the modern jazz quartet. Do they have a history? Oh, you get man. me. You always get me looking. And they <laughs> took jazz. It was out of the nightclubs into more of a concert setting. Yes. And they were elegant, too. Oh, they're sophisticated gentlemen, and each one of them, I mean, I had the privilege of not only going and seeing them live, but actually working with them and talking with them and, and, and getting their stories and stuff. It was an amazing. Melt Jackson, you know, was just one of the most incredible people. And, you know, and, and, I, and I, I, I sort of met each one of them, but he was the one it really kind of stood out in my mind uh, as because he was kind of not only the leader of it, but he was, um, you know, he was kind of the guy that gave it all direction. He was there right from the beginning, the early fifties. These guys have been around a long time by the time I met, them, you know, in the, in the seventies. And um, I just really, uh, well, started at the beginning. We had gotten, we had talked about this before we had gotten a little David records and Little David Records was mainly a comedy label based on Flip Wilson and George Carlin and people like that. They also had several music acts. We talked about Kenny Rankin, who was one of the musical acts. And the other uh, musical act that really stood out was uh, the Modern Jazz Quartet. And I think that was probably because they really respected Monty Kay. Monty Kay had a real um, strong reputation. He was almost like Shep Gordon. But Shep was more into Alice you know, rock and roll and stuff. And Monty was more, a little bit more classical. He, he you know, he was, uh, he produced Diane, uh, Diane Carroll. He was married to her and produced her music. And, and he produced the Flip Wilson show. He was very, he crossed over from music to, to television. And he dabbled a little bit in film. But these guys really respected Monty. And I remember um, going to a club a small club in Santa Monica probably had 20 tables in it. And there weren't that many people there because it turned out that it was a, almost like a private concert or private performance put on by the modern jazz quartet for Monty Kay and Jack Lewis and, you know, myself and um, Don Costa. And I don't know whether you know who Don Costa is, but he produced all of Frank Sinatra's big hits and Kenny Rankin was his protege. So this whole, and, and Monty Kay and Don, and you know, they were all just kind of linked together and we were part of that. The same way with Alive and Alice Cooper, we were that same kind of situation with comedy and blues and, you know, it was just an incredible time. And we went to the small club in Santa Monica and Joan Rivers was the MC for this. <laughs> concert this performance it wasn't even a concert it was a performance and i didn't I, you know i wondered why the place wasn't packed because these are major people and it was really kind of sort of a private you know kind of performance for monty and don costa who was going to get involved with them and was already involved with kenny rankin and, and and i didn't really know who don costa was but I, I mean, I knew, you know, the more contemporary, like Bob Ezrin and, and people like that, their bones out that were, you know, doing a different kind of music. And, and Don Costa was like a superstar. And he was just a really nice guy. And, and, you know, Monty had told him about the stuff that we were doing for little David and stuff out of my past and Pacific Ioneer. I hit it off really well with him. But we, so Joan Rivers opened this thing and she was hysterical. And, you know, and, and, um, and then the modern jazz quartet came on and it was amazing. I, I had heard their music. I had been influenced by their music, but I never really went to a concert of theirs. And I never really, um, I never really got, you know, that tight with them like I did with this. And it was just an amazing experience. And they were incredible. They were totally incredible. And, you know, you had mentioned, when we talked about doing this uh, this chat on the Modern Jazz Quartet, that you know they were really kind of not in the in the realm of what we really want to concentrate rock and roll, but 
they and you brought it up when you had talked about Eric Clapton and how he was influenced by jazz. And then I did a little deep dive myself, and there's all these different major acts. Yes, that, you know from the beat. I mean, you name it, they were all influenced by jazz. And the same way that you know musicians were influenced by the '50s, you know, rock, early rock, and and you know, black rock, and, and black music was being now played by. English, you know, ac English musicians and American musicians. And it, it was just an incredible connection that I never really thought about until you mentioned Eric Clapton. And like I said, I did a little bit of digging and all these different people were so influenced by jazz and a lot of them by the modern jazz quartet and the modern jazz quartet were influenced by, you know, the music that was happening in other, they weren't just about jazz. You know, they were just, they were about expanding their horizon. And that when I had that talk with with Mel Jackson, um, it, it, he really sort of made sure that that came across because he knew we were going to be working on a couple of albums for them. And I want to um, I want to bring one of these albums up right now. Let's see if I can. Oh, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Oh, yeah. Just don't push any buttons or any <laughs> real that's, trouble. And that's me. I have to learn that, too, Ernie. Yeah, oh man, it's deadly. All right, so this is uh, we'll talk about the modern, uh, the uh, in memoriam album. This wow. was the first logo, uh, this was the first album that we did for the modern jazz quartet. This was 1973, and this is the logo that I created for the modern jazz quartet album in memoriam. And um, when I was talking about how we were influenced by the same way musicians were influenced by people around them that came maybe even in a different you know part of music they were still influenced by we as artists were the same way this front cover that we did for the album and and mainly the back cover but more the front cover this was drew struzan did this illustration it's an oil painting and it's fashioned after if you know who maxfield parish was he was a very famous illustrator. He was around the same time as um, J.C. Leindecker and Norman Rockwell. All those guys were kind of Cole Phillips were um, all, you know, in that same era. And um, Maxwell Parrish did all the jello ads when you saw them in magazines. All those beautiful look a lot like this, very symmetrical, you know, with with a, a center point in the middle and, you know, Drew was really a painter. and We had talked about that before, but he came out of college as a, well, as a painter and he taught himself how to be an illustrator. And as we were all learning, he was learning too. And we drew a lot of our references from books. I had hundreds of books and we would spend hours just going through books, looking at things and being influenced by that. And Maxfield Parrish became a very big part of Drew. Uh, and his style as he was developing it from a painter that graduated art school as an oil painter to being an incredible illustrator, the most collected illustrator in the world today. And it was through these stages that this was a definitely a Maxfield Parish, you know, parish. And, you know, then he would take this and put some of it with the Rockwell style and developed and a JC Leindecker style. And so Norman Rockwell, Maxwell Parrish, and J.C. Leindecker were the three influences for the Welcome to My Nightmare oil painting that he did for Alice Cooper for the Welcome to My Nightmare uh, album. And that was in heavily influenced by those three illustrators who, you know, in his opinion out of college, you know, illustrators are whores, they'll compromise their work for money, and, you know, a real painter, a real artist would never do that. So, what you see here is a perfect example of a Maxwell Parish. If you have time, you can Google Maxwell Parish and you'll see. I mean, it's uh, it's pretty incredible. And then, you know, we did, uh, he did the illustration of the group. And then we have, because this album had a full uh, orchestra behind it, not just the, the four of them, but there was a full blown orchestra when they recorded this. So you'll see the inner square uh, over here has the full orchestra in there. Uh, and so there's the orchestra with them featured in, in this Maxfield Parish background with the logo I did. The back cover is pretty much just a plain, a lot of type. I mean, there was a lot of text, a lot of people involved in this album. And, uh, and uh, so it was pretty much, 
you know, I mean, what do you do when you have um, all that text? I mean, we talked about this before with the, uh, the British rock, uh, the volume two that we talked about history of British rock, where the whole inside spread is all copy because there were so many 28 acts that were on this particular album. I don't know if you remember when we talked. I remember about- very well. That was a challenge and, and you handled it, it beautifully. Yeah. Um, and, and again, you know, most people don't even think about it. And I guess, you know, why would you, if you're not confronted with that problem, why would you even think about it? it because the person that provides the solution has made it easy for you to ingest it the same way this back cover. I mean, who would ever stop and think, Oh my gosh, you know, man, there's, there's a whole lot of copy here. And, you know, I mean, how, you know, and, and they, they worked that logo in there, but there's no pictures, you know, <laughs> but you know, they, they don't break it down that way. But as a, as a, a designer, you know, you're, you're given those kind of challenges all the time. So, and the history of British rock volume two was a great example. This was another example of that. It works really harmoniously because we took the same background that we put around Drew's illustration here on the front. You see that brown kind of pebble texture uh, because the actual painting uh, on the outsides of it was on white. It was on white illustration board. This is a, an oil painting on white illustration board. And then we added that brown texture behind it because white was too stark and the background uh, would be too busy with, with the, all the type on white. So we wanted to sort of mute it back a bit so people would would be um, interested in reading the copy. It wasn't pushing, it wasn't a pushback on it because if it was black type on white, back people would just, people would go, oh man, I don't, you know, this is a lot to read. Unless you're one of those people that read liner notes and you read everything. And I've met those, I mean, I've met people who, who know everything about an album and who did this and who was the engineer and who produced it and where it was done and, they read all the liner notes over and over, you know I mean? Yeah. Yeah. We're on the same track, Ernie, because, you know, when I was looking at all of the credits, I have a very dear friend who is a jazz host mm-hmm. and he really, when he is presenting a certain jazz piece, he gives you the exact band members name, like who plays the vibraphone, yeah. who plays the drum. So jazz aficionados, what you did, you related to the target audience. Yes. And jazz aficionados want to know all of that. Yeah. And you got to make it, you got to present it in a way that it makes it easy for them to want to look at it and read it. You know, again, it's not a newspaper. This is much more sophisticated than that. It's not black on white. You know, it it needed to be, um, it needed to have that kind of elegance to it that they have. They are, they were, I mean, when, when we saw them in this little club, they were dressed in tuxedos. That was their thing. I mean, they, you know, they were totally sophisticated gentlemen that really understood their instruments and worked so well together. The four of them just were incredible. Uh, and that, like I said, they, they did uh, probably uh, an hour uh, on that little on that little stage in that little club. And, and it's funny because after Joan Rivers did her thing, she came over and sat at the table with us. And I, I got to meet her. I mean, I'm sure she would never remember who I was, but she was very good friends with, with uh, Monty K and Jack Lewis, too. Jack was, was Monty's partner in Little David Records, along with Flip Wilson. Um, and so they, you know, and, and like I said, Monty was so connected already, you know, in the business that the, and to get George Carlin and Flip Wilson back in the 70s on a label, that's a big thing. I mean, they they took them. You know, they took them right out from underneath the big labels, you know, reach because they and, and you know, they had good deals, too. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that, you know, every one of those acts, Kenny and George, I know Kenny for sure, because Kenny and I would talk about it. And I know that, you know, George is not wasn't going to sign some kind of a deal that wasn't detrimental to him. I mean, this was he got shared in. It was like having his own production company but having a couple partners and it was, a, it was a, a real family like alive for quite a while. And, uh, you know, God bless Chef Gordon and Alice Cooper, man, they're still doing it. They're still together. But a lot of these companies that started out like that ended up going in different directions. Little David did, but, you know, so we did this album and it did, you know, it did really well. They were really happy with it. And so about, I don't know, a few months later, 
I'm over at Little David, and Monty's talking about this not this next album that they want to do for the Modern Jazz Quartet. And everybody loved the one that we had done, uh, the first one. And so <laughs> this one, they had photography, and it was awful. It was awful photography. It was so dark, and it, you know, and it, we had to do something with it because it just really needed help. So what we did was I came up with this idea of, and, and again, we had very little time and, you know, really we didn't have an opportunity to photograph them, you know, and we couldn't use stuff that we had taken. We had taken Polaroids of them when Drew did that illustration. We were able to get together with them and, and do a photo shoot for his illustration. When we showed them the sketch of what we wanted to do. So, when we did this album, we were supplied with the photography. It wasn't really not good at all. And then they had some live photography, as you see on the back cover here. And but it wasn't really, and it's live, but but again, it was like um, glass harp when we talked about that, where they were here's the four guys in the group, and they're individual shots. They're playing live. But there are four individual shots. How do you put those four together? They're shot at different angles. So, so what I did was I decided on the front cover to make prints and 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 have them easel on the back so I could adjust them and make it look like doors that are opening. And then you see the blues on on Bach on the floor there. And if you I wish the prints were the, this image was better, but you could see that it definitely looks like a floor with these doors that are opening, levels of doors. And then Bach is in the background. This blues on Bach is kind of interesting because it shows that they were influenced as well. You know, they were influenced by a lot of the classical music. In fact, a lot of the, uh, well, pretty much all of the uh, cuts on the In Memoriam album, we can't choose is what we want to talk about you know, or play after we talk about this because they're all like seven and eight minutes long, you know, so, so, but the Blues on Bach album has uh, shorter cuts and just as good and, and, and in a different, you know, slightly different direction, but they were very influenced by Bach. They did some of his concertos and stuff or whatever you call them, I guess they're a concerto. And I had this live, these four pictures on the back of each one of them live. So I sort of repeated the door opening thing and I took some music, sheet music from Bach and put it on the, and that's kind of the, the floor on the back and the doors are opening up and in the middle are all the credits for the album that you see. So it was, this was kind of a challenge like the others, but in a whole different direction. I was back to having some photography that isn't great. You know, the, the only thing that was good was we had a little bit of time you know, mostly, you know, when we get crash and burn kind of projects, you have anywhere from three, three days to a week. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. And I mean, it had to be done quick. And, you know, I mean, I was, again, we talked about this before, how lucky I was to be able to have artists that were part of what we were doing, part of the Pacific Pioneer Art Department that really could produce. I mean, it. I worked with a lot of artists and I've worked and I worked in a couple of places that had artists that weren't working for me. I was working alongside of them. And it's really sometimes very hard to produce at a volume rate. And we were, I mean, again, I mentioned before that we were doing between four and six albums a month, along with at least four, four, uh, four corporate uh, projects as well. So we were always, you know, buzzing and I was working six and seven days a week. I remember there were four or five years that I went, seven days a week, every week. It was just, I never had any breaks except when I'd go home and sleep and eat, try and have a life, you know? Uh, and, you know, this, this album for me, I really, for the, the limited amount of, of product that we had to work with, I think it came out really well. And again, if you saw the actual album, these are not great images of them. Um, it, I have an album, but it was sort of scuffed and stuff. So anyway, uh, when you see the actual album, it's really beautiful because you really feel that these doors are opening and you go back, your eye goes right back to where it starts with the modern jazz quartet and then the blues of Bach. And then it worked the same way, you know, visually it worked the same way on the back cover. So both worked together in tandem and, and made for, I think, a really beautiful solution to how to, to handle all of this. Stuff. 
This is beautiful. You know, you always get me researching, and that's the thing that I invite our family on the block party to do. Milt Jackson, it was You Discover Music. I happened to be looking at an article, and they were uh, talking about the top vibraphonist, and Milt yes. came in as number one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They were all incredible. They were Every one of them were incredible. But Milt is the one that stands out in my mind. You know, Percy, there's a few, there's three others, but again, he was articulate, so articulate. And I, I again, I, when we, when he, after they did the performance at that little club, you know, I met each one of them, but Milt came over and sat with us and Monty and Jack and myself and, and uh, Don Costa, because I think they were interested in talking to Don Costa about working with them. And again, this Don Costa He's amazing. And, you know, I, I had seen him at this club and about, oh, I don't know, maybe a year later, uh, Kenny's doing After the Roses, um, which was one of his albums that we worked with him. And uh, Don Costa produced it. And we went over to Don's house and he had just had heart surgery. And he opens up his shirt. He's like, there's this, it looks like Frankenstein going from the bottom of his Adam's apple down to the middle of his belly button. You know, and he was talking about it. He was just recouping from that. And, and uh, they did After the Roses, which was an incredible album. And, you know, he's one, he's another one that never really got the kind of recognition that he deserved. Kenny, he, you know, we talked about, you know, Silver Morning, such a great album. But like a seed, he had, I don't know, a dozen albums. And, and we were lucky enough to do four, I think. Uh, but uh, gone way too soon, way too talented. But, uh, Just loved his voice. And uh, I think, and Ernie, I'm going to be uh, looking at this. I think Don Costa may have been the one to have either uh, discovered Trini Lopez or brought him to the forefront. There were a lot of acts that he had a hand in. Oh, yeah. You know, giving them a Frank leg up in the business. Sure. Well, I mean, uh, but, you know, Frank Sinatra was his real. Yeah. Absolute, I mean, because, I mean, the, you know, he was uh, he was the biggest thing in music in the 40s and 50s. Um, and even on into the 60s. I mean, he sort of held his own the same way Elvis did. You know, they had an audience, a core audience that was huge and uh, was able to, you know, appreciate that right up to the time he passed away. And Don was a big part of that. I mean, when we went to Don's house, he was in his, he was in his, he had a recording console and stuff. And it wasn't really a recording studio, but it was where he worked. You know, it was like, I have a design table with my tools. This was his design table with his tools. And I guess he would do stuff on that and then go into a recording studio or wherever he was to, to make it more high end. But uh, he, uh, he had pictures of Sinatra and all the. He was a real pack rat. He had stuff everywhere, but <laughs> incredible stuff, you know. And again, what a great storyteller he was. And and again, he was really, really, really focused on Kenny. He really want. He he thought Kenny was going to be the next Frank Sinatra. He really did. And you know what? Kenny had the chops. Yes. It's, it's hard when you have the ability, but it's. It seems like to get everything in the right spot at the right time. I mean, we used to, in the 60s, we call it when all the planets align, you know, uh, that's when great things happen. Well, it's, it's so difficult. Maybe if it happens once in a lifetime for you, you're lucky. Some people never have it. I mean, I've been very blessed. I've had it several times, but it's real rare. And when it happens, you sit back and just go, wow, that's really something. And, and you know, Kenny had it, but it just – he. Kenny was his own worst enemy, you know, and God bless him. I love him. I miss him a lot. We were best friends for years. And again, a talented, you know, candle that burned twice as bright burns half as long. You're right. We're so glad to have featured him too, you know, in our yeah. chats. Now I was reading when it came to the modern jazz quartet that they were signed to Apple records for a while. Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, I, I never, you know, did equate Apple and jazz. I know, but they were big influencers to the Beatles. The Beatles loved modern jazz quartet and wow. jazz. They were very influenced by jazz, along with American R&B, you know, and early rock. I mean, they were, the Beatles, I mean, they blow my mind. The Beatles, 
I mean, four guitar, uh, three guitars and a drum, and they changed the world. How, do, how does that happen? I mean, I, I, I always sort of think about that, like, what an incredible thing. And then, and then to be turned on by, turned away by every record company in the business, and then go on to do something so instrumental in our culture, in our life, in the world. Yes. I mean, it wasn't like they were just in the U.S. They were global. And, you know, three guitars and a drum, three-part harmony. Amazing. It's one of the reasons I always love Brian Epstein. I'm so glad that he was recognized because he was a real stalwart. He believed in that. The neat thing too about jazz or any of that is now uh, coming into my mind, the jazz fusion band started to become yes. very big, yes. uh, like yes. Blood, yes. Sweat and Tears. And yeah. of course, the yeah. Ides of March with Jim Peterick yeah. and Chicago. Chicago yes. was a great a example. Lot of those, a lot of those acts. I mean, I, you know, they're all listed here. It's, you name it. They're all there. They're all there, and it's just mind blowing because when, like I said, when you mentioned Eric Clapton, I started thinking, wow, you know, I mean, I always liked jazz, but I never really thought about uh, the fusion of, of jazz into rock and roll and who was influenced by who. And look at these names; I mean, they're they're everybody in the business, pretty much, you know. So yeah, Sly and the Family Stone, Can Heat, you know, Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> the list think- goes on and on. I think of Charlie Watts with his playing and Charlie was never one. Uh, This is what I read, you know, when it comes to drum solos, he says, no, I don't really get into that. I'm into more of accompaniment, which I think is, is more, which was a lot of jazz drummers had that same mindset. And Charlie's uh, playing was if, if, if you listen very closely, was not of the power drummer, but just beautiful grooves that he played. Yeah. Yeah, he was a great drummer. I I, I really uh, love the Rolling Stones. I mean, they are the the greatest rock and roll band in history, and you know, hopefully, they'll retain that for a long time. Mm-hmm. 